Okay, this is Front Office Sports. We've got Giorgio Ferlani, the CEO of AC Milan, in studio. Giorgio, thanks for being here. Thank you guys for having me. So it's AC Milan from Italy, but here we are in New York City. You are on a bit of a U.S. tour. What is AC Milan up to in the U.S.? Why are you here in America? Yeah, very good question. So first of all, uh, we are an American-owned company. So our main shareholder is uh, Redbird Capital. An investor uh, in FOS as well, we should say. Yeah, and uh, you know, one of the leading global investors in sports media and entertainment. And uh, we work very synergistically and uh, together with them to, uh, to create value and to grow uh, AC Milan. Um, the, we're here specifically to play friendlies. Uh, we're playing a friendly tomorrow uh, against Man City uh, in Yankee Stadium, and then we'll be playing uh, in Chicago against Real Madrid, and then in Baltimore uh, against Barcelona. Uh, but around that, uh, obviously the U.S. is a really important market for us. Um, I just talked about playing at uh, Yankee Stadium. We have a partnership with the Yankees. Um, they are investors as well in AC Milan, um, and uh, we have various co collaborations with them. Uh, we, um, some of our content goes into the Yes Network. Um, we have two American players uh, in our squad. Um, you know, one is Christian Pulisic, arguably the best player the country has ever produced. Uh, and look, we have him because he's a really good player, not because he's American, but obviously, um, you know, the two things work together. Uh, and broadly speaking, um, America is the biggest sports market in the world, and we want to be relevant in this market. Mm. We want to continue growing here. It has become our second biggest market uh, over the years. We sell just under 20% uh, of our jerseys globally uh, wow. in America. And How much of that is Pulisic, right? Uh, a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, we want to continue growing here and we want to give our existing partners from around the world the visibility through AC Milan uh, in America as well. So uh, very important for us to be here. We were in the States last year as well on the West Coast. Um, and it was five years we hadn't been in the States. So really important for us wow. uh, to be here Physically. Do you think this will now be an annual uh, pilgrimage? Uh, look, it, it, the summer is you know, kind of the off season, let's say, of, in the world of soccer. And it is uh, tradition to go on tours, let's say, to play friendlies against other top teams like us to kind of uh, get ready for the season. Uh, we've done it in America uh, the, the last two years. Um, I think we'll come here often. Mm. Uh, this is, as I said, an important market. And look, in terms of soccer in America, look, it's been growing uh, over the last couple decades. Uh, it's been, let's say, gaining market share. Uh, and, you know, this will continue going on. Um, you know, you have the World Cup here in 2026. So I think leading up to that and way beyond that, soccer will be uh, more and more important and more relevant in America, and we want to we want to play here. This is sort of a um, a recent-ish movement. The idea that you know European and and global soccer clubs really want to be in the states. You know, you said it's a really important market to you. What do you think happened in the last few years that that fueled that even more? I mean, at some point, you know, we could do the numbers, but there's also just anecdotally, we can all see it, we can all feel it. There is a soccer movement in the states. You know, maybe it's thanks to the World Cup and the, the international scale. Uh, the women's game has also been gaining a, a ton of popularity over the last few years. But what do you think are like the driving factors here? And, and what do you see happening in the near future uh, with that trend? Yeah, I think, I think a number of things. Uh, so number one, soccer was a bit of a, allow me to say, maybe distant fifth mm -hmm. sport in the U.S. And it's been growing, growing uh, in, in popularity, and it's gotten a bit to that critical scale to a certain extent. Um, uh, changes in demographics in the US, the fact that soccer uh, tailors to a more uh, diverse population, if you look at the stats compared to other sports, a younger crowd. Um, and you know the fact that European uh, clubs or teams or franchises that uh, effectively own the leading IP and the best content uh, in, in soccer in the same way that in other sports, 
the leading content is is in America, they've uh, really, uh, let's say, gone on a strategy to push the sport mm -hmm. in America. So it's, it's kind of both, let's say, demand-driven as well as supply-driven. And the two things have worked together over uh, the last few years. There's another element, uh, which is Americans, American families and investors it's just going to go there. Right? Have invested more and more in in European soccer or football, as we call it, uh, and uh, and that has also created, I think, an interest in America, uh, in in the sport that pre previously wasn't there. Yeah, some of this does seem investment driven. I mean, you guys being owned by Redbird, and as you mentioned, the the Yankees and the relationship with. Man City there, you know, I've gone to uh, NYC FC games and in the same family there in terms of the investment. Um, there's a little bit of a shift away in some cases from the one family owns a club for, for decades, right? I mean, originally it was the Berlusconi's for, for AC Milan. How do you think that changes things either with the fan base? Maybe fans are largely unaware once you move from a family ownership model to private equity. But uh, you know, how does that affect kind of overall operations? Um, yeah, so I think I'll speak for European soccer. Uh, um, you know, it's an industry that hasn't really been professionalized over mm -hmm. the last many decades, and um, you know, professional investors have seen this. They've done the benchmarking, and they've seen the enormous amounts of value that have been created in owning US franchises. And then they look at what is the most followed sports in the world, and they look at sort of the, you know, where is the sport really, where are the big brands or the big IP in, in soccer, and it's in sort of the top or European football clubs. And they see that, you know, they're kind of undermanaged, underinvested, not professionalized. It's a very closed system. And so this means there's a gigantic opportunity um, to uh, professionalize the industry, professionalize leagues, professionalize teams, um, and, and really grow the value uh, in, a, in a similar way that has happened in American sports and that in Europe we're just at the beginning of all of that. Let's talk a little bit about your, your peers. In fact, at FOS we wrote a story recently about how Real Madrid set a single year revenue record. For, for any you know, global soccer club. When you look at that, does that get your competitive juices flowing? I mean, there's performance on the field, and then obviously, especially for us and our interest in what we cover, there's uh, performance you know, in, the, in the books. So does that drive you to try new things, grow revenue in interesting ways? To what extent do you look at you know, your peers? 100%. We look at our peers and we, uh, we see what they're doing, uh, just like they look at us. Um, uh, I'll tell you a fun fact, um, you know, when the current leadership of Real Madrid, so the chairman Florentino Perez, took over Real Madrid about 20 years ago, AC Milan had higher revenues than Real Madrid. And he said, that's the model I want to I reach and then beat. And he's managed, so congrats to him. Um, you know, in the same way, we look at, you know, what they've been able to do, and, and we look at that as a target. Mm. Uh, and, you know, there's no sort of underlying uh, reason that we cannot get there. Uh, but of course, we're, we're, we're very far from that. We're roughly uh, a little less than half of what they have in terms of revenue, which means there's a great upside uh, for us to be, to be able to achieve. So look, we need to work as AC Milan on our business. We need to work together with our league, so the Italian league, to grow the league and kind of the eyeballs and the attention on the league. Um, part of our business is driven by the league or leagues we're in. And so how they are being monetized because we have effectively a share of uh, the revenue created by the league. And part of it is, is generated by the work we do with our sort of on, our, on the commercial side. Uh, look, winning or being competitive is important. Uh, in, in many ways. A lot of the revenues we generate are in one way or another correlated to success on the field. Uh, and so the way media rights are split, they're, they're sort of success dependent in some ways or correlated to that. 
And then a lot of other revenues we have are dependent on our success and you know, how we can um, have other partners associate with us being successful on, uh, on the field. So that's an element. Uh, but uh, just going back to what you said about sophisticated investors investing in European football, that definitely does not mean success at all costs. That's right. where a lot of people have been burned in soccer, where you chase the glory and you kind of spend senselessly and it doesn't really make financial sense. And ultimately that's a trying to chase glory in the short term, but in the long term, uh, you get in trouble. And that, that, that then starts impairing your ability to be competitive on the field. So what we try to do is we set ourselves up at kind of in this period of the season, so at the beginning of the sporting season, to be successful, to be able to win the league in Italy and to be in the Champions League and be competitive in the Champions League. But we do this while ra running a financially sustainable business. Mm -hmm. And so uh, another fun fact for you, um, two years ago, we had the first profit in AC Milan's history uh, since uh, 17 years. So for 17 years, AC Milan was operated as a loss. Um, last year, we had a second consecutive year in which we're, we generated a profit. And I don't think AC Milan has ever had in its history two consecutive years of, of making a profit. What does that mean then? Um, we don't put ourselves in a situation where, where we're cash constrained, we cannot invest, uh, and so on and so forth. So running a successful business together with a successful sporting side, the two things go together, and the two things are ultimately what create value in, in, in the club. We've been talking about looking at your peers, other clubs, both financially, on the field, you know, measuring yourself against them, Real Madrid and others. What about in the U.S., especially because you're so focused right now on growing the fan base in the U.S.? Do you look at the big U.S. sports league, either the team owners, what they've done, on the tech side, the commissioners? Do you take pages for, for management and performance from the U.S. leagues? So the U.S. leagues have a very different setup yes. than European uh, soccer. And sort of that model is hard slash impossible to really import or export into, uh, into Europe. Because we have, uh, you know, we have domestic leagues, so Italy or Germany or Spain, et cetera, et cetera. We have within that league what's called promotion relegation. Mm -hmm. And you have qualification for Europe-wide competitions. And, and so as opposed to being a closed system, with a draft and a salary cap and all these setups of American leagues, it's, it's what I'll call like an open system in which you move up and down uh, into leagues in a given country and effectively into leagues in Europe. You move up and down if you qualify for Champions League or Europa League, which is the second to Champions League, et cetera. And you're on your own. You're very much, Yes, you know. correct. And so, so in terms of what can we learn from US leagues and how they're set up, I can say we can learn a lot, but can you really copy paste that in, into European soccer? No, yeah. uh, really. Uh, and I also mean marketing, you know, to a fan base. Yeah. It's like the Yankees hat is a global symbol. Yes. Even to people who certainly don't follow baseball. Yes. So now, can you copy s certain things that individual franchises do uh, in, in America into the way we operate and run our business? Certainly 100% and we're doing it. Uh, so um, we do like to uh, see what others are doing successfully and try and imitate it. Um, and sometimes um, it, it's, it's on, what I'll say on-field stuff that goes from the medical to the use of analytics, mm. uh, analysis of opposition, et cetera, et cetera, to in the front office. And how do you kind of develop your business, develop your brand, and also another one is infrastructure. So stadiums, basically. Yep. So you know the, the, the best stadiums in the world, forget what sport it is, but are in America. Uh, just like the experience that you're able to offer to your fans in an, a new American stadium is very different uh, than the one we can offer our fans, for example, in our stadium which is a 70-year-old stadium, which is a bit of a, 
a glorious stadium that kind of, if you ask soccer fans around the world and you say, look, give me the three stadiums you want to visit in your life, you know, most likely in those three is going to be San Siro, which is the stadium we play out at. But it's an old stadium. It was built a long time ago. Hard to without, that, yeah, that building. It, it, yeah. And so, look, we're working on a new stadium project uh, in a place called San Donato, which is a, a town just outside Milan. And uh, we do want to offer our fans the same type of experience that fans in America have, or also look in, in other places in Europe, there are new stadiums, like in England, they, they have been more successful at building stadiums. So that's, that's also one thing we copy, if you want, from, from America. We've been talking so much about like, the push and pull between the international game, coming into the US, growing the fan base here. Where do things stand in what used to be the age-old trend of international stars finish out their playing days in the U.S., often in the MLS, Lionel Messi mm -hmm. right now, versus here we are with AC Milan talking about Pulisic, an American player playing over in Italy. You know, is there a, what's, what's the balance now of either American players come abroad or it's international stars winding down their career in, in the U.S.? Yeah, so that's really interesting. So, um, look, let me just say the U.S. Uh, soccer team and the players coming out of the U.S. have, over the last decades, really improved in quality. And Christensen is an example. As a, as a young teenager, he was a hot prospect, and he, he first went to Germany and then England and then uh, came to us. And, you know, uh, you know Yunus Musa is our other uh, U.S. players kind of same story. He was, you know, since a very young age, he was, uh, you know, a, a hot prospect, if that's a word. And, uh, and he's, he's had a phenomenal career. He will have a phenomenal career. He's a 2002. As we, 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 we don't talk about the age of a player. We say the year he was born. That, that's kind of soccer spiel. Uh, and um, um, so you see a lot of young American players that come to Europe and kind of, if you want, complete their development mm. as young players and really play in the top leagues, no problem. Um, and that trend is, is gonna keep continuing. Now, what I've seen in the MLS is an interesting, if you want, dual trend of the, the kind of superstars like Messi you mentioned, uh, uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, mm -hmm. who's Part of the leadership at, uh, leadership at AC Milan is, is also did something similar, even though then he decided to come to AC Milan and finish out his career at AC Milan, winning a title, which was kind of an amazing story. Uh, and, you know, the guy who was our striker for the last three years, Olivier Giroud, he also just moved to, to the MLS uh, uh, in, in Los Angeles. So, so you definitely have the superstars want to finish their career in the US. But you also have another trend, which is uh, youngsters, either American or Canadian or from Latin America, go early into the MLS right. and really kind of develop there and then move when they're still young, but call it young to mid-career, uh, and then they move into, into Europe. So Big leagues. Into the, yeah, well, if you want, uh, and so, so there is there is also this. Let's not just take the, you know, end of career European stars or, or or South Americans that were in Europe for most of their career, but let's also go early in mm. this you know this great pool of talent which is South America and let's try and sign some some young players over there. Something to watch for sure. Uh, let's end this way. So you got a game in Yankee Stadium this yeah. week. Next week, Soldier Field, home of the Chicago Bears. How will you measure whether this U.S. jaunt has been a success? Uh, so, not on the field. And right. what I mean by that is, um, you know, these are games that you're, you're, you are putting your team to compete with other top teams uh, to prepare for the season that for us starts in, on the 17th of August. Uh, and it's not really about kind of winning the game, but sort of preparing for the season and how we're tactically set up. We have a new coach, so how is he, he going to field the team, et cetera. 
Um, we will consider it a success if there's something that we can take from this tour and bring it, if you want, into the medium and long term. So that means fans. We have an existing fan base. We come here also to engage with our fans. Uh, we want to build more fans. Uh, it means partnerships with companies that see the power of soccer and how it is growing uh, globally and specifically in America and want to work with us uh, and our existing partners and us uh, being able to uh, you know, give them visibility and bring them here with us. So it's a success if I wake up in six months or a year and there's something from this tour that you know, we've, we've created and we brought, brought with us and kept on growing with it. Got it. Well, good luck on the field. Thank you so much. Mille grazie. Thanks for joining us. Grazie a lei. Arrivederci.